that it's Good morning and a very warm welcome to the Mike from Newland Show. It's a pleasure to be back in the studios of Cape Conscious Media and it's a pleasure to have a guest that I've been looking forward to talking to for quite some time. So a very warm welcome viewers. Um, I want to thank you all again for tuning in. I want to also thank everybody that's contributed to the show, leaves comments, uh, friendly or otherwise. They are appreciated, whatever your view is. Um, very welcome and bear in mind uh, viewers that this is about discovering and understanding various political parties manifestos a little better I, I forget how many parties we're dealing with um, but it's huge it's over the hundreds it's probably 200 or something I believe we're going to have a little booklet by the time all is said and done so it's going to be impossible to deal with all the parties' manifestos, but I've taken the main parties because I feel they're the parties that are in Parliament that are making a difference and will make a difference simply because a one-man show, bless them, are not really going to cut it. So I'm concentrating on the more major parties in Parliament, and one of those parties is the African uh, Christian Democratic Party, the ACDP, and I'm really pleased to have in the studio the Deputy President from the ACDP, Wayne Thring. Wayne, a very warm welcome. Good morning, and Mike, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Looking forward to our interaction and discussions. Indeed, so am I, and you are very welcome. Thank you. Um, a couple of things, dear viewers, that I just want to deal with before we get stuck in. One of the questions that I'm going to ask uh, Wayne, if I don't get too wrapped up in the other issues, is the relevance of Parliament. I mentioned on my show last week something that really annoyed me is and nothing in Parliament annoys me much anymore because I don't really rate Parliament. I have really written Parliament off, quite frankly, as a bit of a waste of time and a huge burden to the taxpayer to the tune of something like over a billion rand, apparently, it costs. And one of the reasons I'm annoyed is the fact that SAA, uh, which is now, I heard this morning, I mean, once again is about to be buried. Uh, the minister, Minister Pravin Gordon, had the nerve to walk into the committee room and try and chase the press out because he didn't want the press to know, and that means us, the taxpayer, to find out how this quite obvious scam was being funded and how the few selected BEE candidates that were in part of this Takata or whatever it's called, I really don't care, uh, had um, some sort of scheme where they were going to borrow our money or from somebody else, but certainly wasn't going to use theirs because it's $3 billion. So they want to borrow that money from somewhere, use that to fund the airline. And when the airline lost more money, then they were obviously going to come back to the government through the PIC or wherever it is and borrow more of our money. So it has been buried. It's gone. I think also probably the end of SAA. And sadly, I have to say, well done and good riddance. It's an airline that I once flew with with pride, and now the fact every time I did fly on it when I briefly worked for the government was quite painful because I knew every seat, every time I flew, some poor person was paying some money towards my seat, and that just didn't make me feel very comfortable. 
So I'm very pleased that's happened, and I have to say, uh, when uh, Pravin Gordon leaves, you will not be missed. The other thing about Parliament is we don't deal with issues. Committees are held. SAA is a classic example. When they pitch, they don't bring the balance sheets. When they do bring the balance sheets, they don't balance. Um, the Lady R, the Parler Parler situation, scandals, those are all squashed by Parliament. In other words, we really get absolutely nowhere with Parliament and now <laughs> the Speaker of Parliament has now be, is being investigated for taking the Secretary of Parliament, Scalani George, a gentleman who has promised and earns 2.2 million rand a month. <laughs> I can't get my head around that. And then he gets, a, after a few months, gets a 70% increase. He now earns more than the President of the country. And he is the Secretary of Parliament. Now, that is, doesn't make Parliament a, a bank for the ANC and simply a way to launder money. I don't know what does. And the other thing that I just want to touch on is this election monitoring, and also, once again, would like to ask Wayne his opinion on this. At first, I was a little irritated because, I mean, we are, after all, a sovereign country. But then I thought about it a little bit, and I decided, in actual fact, this is probably the best thing that could happen to us. We are downgraded, grey-listed. We have become the pariah of the world. In fact, we begin to very much look like the old apartheid state. There is nothing that we do right. We have Marikana, we have... Uh, Ekerileni, um, uh, sorry, Esidomeni, where we literally starved 140 patients to death. Our place in the world is starting to look extremely shaky, apart from the fact that we get into, a, into bed with the world's greatest psychopath. If ever I thought there was the devil himself, that would be Putin. And that is our big friend, who, by the way, has just declared that he's ready for war on the world, nuclear-wise, just the other day. But this is the friends that we keep. But getting back to this voting station, we have something like 23,000 uh, voting stations. Seems like a huge amount, but that's what my uh, research tells me. And we've got 28 million potential voters. Now, I worked as a polling station agent for many years, and I understand exactly how the system worked. And when I was interviewed by a lady from Canadian TV and asked the question, are our elections free and fair? I could look her in the eye and proudly say, yes. And she said, why? And I explained that because the votes are counted on site, they're balanced on site, all the political parties involved in the election can be on site should they wish. We all agree on the numbers, the numbers that get phoned through to IEC head office, and it's a done deal. There can be no dispute because that dispute is revolved at the time at the polling station. The votes are not moved around. But now I'm getting worried because we've got so many polling stations that there's no way that the ACDP can get to every polling station or the DA or the Freedom Front Plus or anybody else for that matter. Some of these polling stations are probably just going to have maybe the EFF and, may, and the ANC. How are we going to know that the, everything is above board? We don't. And we're reminded by the fact by Zuma, Ace Mahashuli and Julius Malema just recently said, unbelievably to me, how naive am I? that they're not going to allow these elections to be corrupted. Well, good grief. <laughs> I mean, what? Well, what did I not know about in the last elections? What did I not know about? So, no, I'm not embarrassed to have England, France, Europe coming here monitoring the elections. I think the more the merrier, because it comes down to one thing. One thing, ladies and gentlemen, and that is jobs, jobs, jobs. And if we're going to jeopardize just one job by a company wanting to pull out because they don't think our elections are free and fair, we have failed. So let's get America in here. Let's get everybody in here. I don't care where they come from. It cannot be a problem if the IEC is doing everything above board. There can be nothing wrong with that. So why the ANC is getting itself all uh, bitter and twisted about it, I do not know. And just in conclusion... I did warn Wayne, I tend to rant a bit. But just in conclusion, I was very disappointed with this LL Airline story. Because, look, I, I just keep going back to every guest I have. What are we doing to, A, preserve jobs in this country? We have the highest unemployment in this country. And it's getting worse. Our economy is not even growing 1%. Yet we have the ANC and these Hamas supporters who literally could not contain their excitement on the fact that LL is not flying here anymore. Well, I don't give a damn whether LL flies here, where, there, or anywhere. What I do give a damn about the fact is that airlines not coming here three times a week. That means another 10, 20 jobs have been lost. Now, it's not my war. 
I don't, I don't live near Israel. I don't live near Gaza. I'm not a member of the Hamas. I don't even know much about them. And I certainly don't live in the Ukraine or Russia. But I do know I do live here. And I do know that 200 black children, 200 black children, die in this country every month of starvation. I've put this to ANC members. Do you know what they do? They go, yeah, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. And then they, that's it. But heaven forbid something happens on the other side of the world. Well, we're all up in arms. So now I want to ask Hamas supporters, and I want to ask uh, ANC, did you bother to actually find out who these families are? The one, the two, the ten, the twenty that are not going to be employed, that now have no food on the table. Did you bother to ask them whether they thought it was a good idea to have another airline cancel here so we have less jobs in this country so you... You can carry out your ideological dream, whatever that might be. Or maybe you have. Maybe you phoned them up and maybe you said, guys, we're very sorry you're going to lose your jobs. But, you know, it's for our ideology. It's for the country. It's for the greater good. Here's a a couple of grand every month to keep you going. Did you do that? (laughs) I don't think so. But anyway, jobs, jobs, jobs. And that's what I want to talk about. That's what I always talk about. Because, frankly, dear viewers, Without the dignity of work, we have nothing in this country. I said it before and I'll say it again. A man has no dignity if he has no work, if he can't provide for his family. And we are losing jobs in this country hand over fist because we have an ideology that I don't even begin to understand. But nevertheless, I digress now. And now I must go back to my guest who's been very patient. Um, Wayne... Obviously, there's a couple of burning issues to deal with. Once again, welcome to the uh, show. And I want to just quickly ask you, give me a minute or two, because I've stolen so many minutes from you already. Mm. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, You're obviously with the ACDP, and you're big cheese there. You're the uh, deputy president. Um, How did you end up in politics? Was it uh, something that drove you, or was it something that snapped one day? You said, damn it, I'm going to get involved. (laughs) What is it about? What makes you tick? Well, a little bit of my background. I'm, I'm married. I have uh, three kids, <clears throat> uh, three, four grandchildren. Uh, the last one is just recently born, Mila. Um, I grew up in a normal, uh, average income family. My dad was a bricklayer, hard worker. Um, five, five children, uh, schooled in the area of uh, Sydenham, uh, just outside of Durban, for about five kilometers outside of Durban. Um, my schooling was uh, Sydney Primary and then went to uh, Ambilo and then Beshe and then eventually Beshe Teachers Training College. Um, so um, if we kind of fast forward, um, I, when I was at college, um, I was involved in the uh, UDF. Uh, it was uh, the time of the struggle and was a youth leader. Uh, in the in the youth the UDF and worked with many of the uh, some of the top brass that are now within the uh, the ANC uh, at the time. Then in 1984, so this was probably from about 1979 to about 1984 was my years of of, of engaging in the struggle. 1984, I I came to Christ. Um, I had a, a change of life. Um, a change of experience and committed my my life then in 1984 to the church. So from 1984 up to 1995, um, I I worked uh, within the church, uh, grew within the church, served within the church. 1995, while studying um, for one of my degrees in the church building, I was reading the book by Sheldon. Uh, in his steps, mm. and in that book, uh, it there's a challenge that goes out to those who are very comfortable with the the corruption, um, and the question was asked: What would Jesus do? Would he just close his eyes and shut his eyes um, to the corruption that is around him, or would he speak against it? And the challenge was that he would speak against it. And um, so as I'm reading this, we were now approaching local government elections. And so I felt the prompting to get back in politics. I shut the door on politics in 1984. Um, 
And so 1995, I now felt the call in our local church to get back, to get involved. And I prayed and I said, Lord, if you want me to get involved, send, send somebody to me. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go and wave my flag. Those mm-hmm. are the words that I used. <laughs> the next day, Brother Simon Haynes, Mr. Simon Haynes comes knocking on the church door and he says, Wayne, the ACDP is having a meeting uh, at the community hall. Don't you want to come? And I said, well, no, I'm studying. I've got exams to write. And then I heard... The voice of the Lord saying, what did you say to me yesterday? I said, okay, I've got an hour, I'll go. And so I, I went up to the meeting, uh, Trish Jalbert and uh, Gavin Stone were there presenting on behalf of the ACDP. I sat right at the back, um, I listened, and then as I was about to leave, Gavin stopped me and he says, uh, please, can you close in prayer? And when I opened my eyes, he was standing next to me, invited me to another meeting, and the rest is history. <laughs> I served I served again in ev- almost every capacity in the ACDP, started my two branches, which I still have today, 1995. Um, I worked as the branch chair, the uh, provincial chair, deputy chair first, and then provincial chair, provincial leader, federal council of provinces chairman, overseen uh, leading the nine provinces for the ACDP, um, and then deputy president. Councillor for the ACDP from the year 2000 to 2019 uh, and 2019 elected to serve the ACDP in in Parliament. So that is um, uh, my brief history in a, in a nutshell. Um, there's, there's more gaps that can be filled, but... Uh, but that's how I got involved in the ACDP, and that's my story. Okay. <laughs> I'm convinced you certainly did get a calling, and you have definitely reacted to it. Yeah. So, wow, you've certainly put your time in. So, fantastic. That's great, and uh, that's a lovely story. So, let's get down to business, now that we know a little bit more about you. Now, according to uh, Hanif Daniel, uh, Hendricks, Hendricks. Sorry, of the uh, Al Jamal party, who was in our studios last week, uh, he took me a little bit by surprise uh, <laughs> by making the declaration that the uh, these various parties that receive money from America. Now, this was the question I prompted. I was there to ask him about his manifesto. This really came out of the blue. <laughs> and I said, wow, I didn't know that. Who were these parties? And right at the top of the list, would you believe, was the African Christian Democratic Party. Along came the DA and uh, Freedom Front Plus, and I can't remember who else it IFP. was. Oh, the IFP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I won't deny the fact I was a bit taken aback. And as you know, I uh, asked for proof of this. So he said, no, he said, it's out there. It's uh, just go and Google it. Well, I did. I've never seen. I couldn't find a thing. Um, but I felt a bit of a fool even Googling it because I knew it was complete nonsense. Um, and then uh, <laughs> I thought, well, I kind of realized when I asked him the next question, I said, so where did you get this information? He said, the minister. And I thought to myself, right, the minister of the ANC, which will lie to us from kingdom coming back, will lie to us about the five, and he actually believes them. But I was too polite. I didn't feel it was my place to say that, although I regret it now, because quite frankly, it's complete nonsense. Or is it? Now, I want to know, do you get this money via credit card? Uh, does Biden send you a little envelope and trust our postal services and whack a few dollars in there in a kind note? Or does he just uh, credit your bank accounts? How does the money get you that Hanif says so, <laughs> arrives well, regularly and does Biden put a little hello note in it? Well, like absolute, as you said, absolute nonsense. Mm. Um, obviously, we, we did our research as well. And we said, well, was this something that we missed? That uh, Was it Hanif and the minister himself? Um, that had this kind of private meeting because he says the minister had the meeting with uh, the leaders of political parties and certainly our leader uh, was was not there and neither do I think the leaders of the other political parties that he mentioned were there. Um, but absolutely ludicrous. It is spurious. It is libelous. Mm. Um, it is in politically, and we're putting it in diplomatic terms, terms he has been economical with the truth. Um so if you if you look at the, the the books of the ACDP, if you look at the income of the ACDP, um, the the ACDP's income is derived primarily from our uh, members and, and our supporters, and then we get our equitable share 
and, and proportional share also from the uh, from the IEC. So those essentially are mm. the two mm. the two sources of income for the for the ACDP. There is no amount. We also have to produce if there is any. Uh, income or any donation over a hundred thousand rand, we have to declare it. Uh, we don't declare because we don't get that kind of money over a hundred thousand rand uh, that comes into the coffers of of the ACDP. We rely purely on the generosity of our members um, and uh, and our supporters to to a mm. large extent. Mm. Um, so the 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 accusations by Mr. Uh, Hendricks were spurious, libelous. Um, far from the truth, um, the, the ACDP is not controlled, is not controlled by the United States of America, is not controlled by any foreign government. Um, we have our vision, we have our policies, we have our constitution, uh, we have our worldview, and we are guided by our worldview, our policies, and our constitution. There is no foreign government, not the United States of America, nor any other foreign uh, entity that is assisting financially uh, or otherwise the, the ACDP. Um, and so these these allegations that, that Mr. Hendricks made um, will be challenged. Uh, we are we are considering actually approaching the ethics committee uh, to hold Mr. Hendricks to account uh, because he made he brought the the minister as he calls it of intelligence, state security. Um, he used her name, uh, and uh, it, it it was it was libelous. Um, and that's diplomatically mm. speaking. Mm. And so we, we are considering, we reserving our rights, We've spoken to also our legal team, um, and, and they will certainly come back to us in terms of what, in what our actions are. Uh, but very clearly, uh, Mr. Hendricks must have been smoking something uh, on that particular day. Uh, I would hate mm. to think what was in that particular pipe uh, that he was smoking. But very okay. clearly, uh, the ACDP is not funded mm. by any mm. outside force, mm. any outside mm. source, neither are we engaged in regime change. We are not engaged in a soft coup d'etat. Um, the, the, the coup d'etat, the coup d'etat, or the beachhead, the coup d'etat possibly is something that perhaps, perhaps it's, mm. it's a, it's what they mm. call reverse mm. psychology. Mm. Perhaps it's something that Mr. Hendricks and his mm. political party mm. himself uh, mm. have been contemplating mm. with some of their allies like Iran, and Hamas and Hezbollah Harry. and ISIS and, and some of those other groups uh, wanting to declare possibly a jihad year in, in South Africa um, and turn this uh, and turn our beautiful country uh, into uh, something which, uh, which uh, none of us would want to see in, in South Africa. Um, but very certainly I can say to you categorically uh, that the ACDP is not involved in any regime change, uh, soft coup d'etat, um, if there is going to be any change, uh, we want to see that change come via the ballot. And this is what the ACDP has been working towards over the last 30 years um, and continue to do so. Uh, let me indicate, maybe uh, just, Mike, while I'm there, that, you know, look, the, the ACDP over the last 30 years, if you look at the ACDP, it's, we are a political party that has been growing, um, obtained two seats nationally in 1994, and we had many uh, individuals, the critics, the skeptics, the cynics, who said that uh, nothing is going to amount from this so-called religious right-wing fanatical party. Um, but we have confounded all of our skeptics and critics. And we got two seats uh, in 1994 and then continued to grow. If you look at our current tra trajectory from 20. 14, uh, the ACDP obtained just over 100,000. There was a bit of a political wilderness after the floor-crossing debacles yeah, uh, that we went through. 2014, we went through a little bit of a political wilderness, uh, sorry, from about 2009 to 2014. 2014, over 100,000 votes. Uh, 2019, we had about 146,000 votes. And 2021, over 200,000 votes. So the, the projection mm. for the ACDP uh, is certainly an upward tra uh, tra uh, trajectory. Mm. And if one looks at uh -huh. our manifesto launch, the biggest, largest, best, 
most exuberant, fantastic manifesto launch that we had at the Ellis Park Arena. Uh, structures from all nine provinces traveled, many of them throughout the night, um, 24, some almost 40 hours uh, traveled to get to the stadium. It was the best um, and the largest manifesto launch that we've ever had. It's an indication that the ACDP is no longer a small political party, but certainly one of the political parties uh, that must be taken note of. Yeah, I want to just comment on that. Uh, so I first came across the ACDP uh, when I attended the uh, Right to Know campaign. I was a member of that with a wonderful guy called Murray Hunter, um, and he's since gone on to do really good work. Um, but I attended most of the meetings, and you had a member there. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you, I've forgotten his Stephen. Steve but, Swartz? Uh, Steve Swartz. Yes. Lovely man. Yes. I really was a lovely man. They made it his business to come over and ask us what we were doing there because he found it interesting that the members of the public were well, somebody taking yeah. some interest because I was literally at that stage just a spectator. So it was very interesting to watch him at work and watch the ACDP work. It was a very important bill that they were trying to force through Parliament and it, uh, I, I'm happy to say that the Right to Know campaign and people like Steve Swart and your party made sure that it didn't happen. Uh, and uh, so it was a real win-win for me. And yeah. uh, But he did do great work, and I was very impressed with ACDP from that day on. So I think you oh, guys have you. done work, and you do you do um, punch above your weight, and well done for that. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. I'd like to just go on to the manifesto now, if I may. So it's a great manifesto. I, um, I've got to the stage I'm becoming a little bit of a manifesto expert. <laughs> so I want to jump around a little bit, but uh, um, but I want to just... I want to ask the first question I'm going to ask because I'm scared I'll forget. And this is a bugbear of mine, is that when under I was born into apartheid and went to school, white schools, all this kind of thing. And one of the frustrations I had uh, when uh, after doing my military service, which was a compulsory thing, was it occurred to me I can't speak one African language. And suddenly I was in the employment market and and 90% of the country was all black. And I, I walked around speaking English and Afrikaans. Mm. And one of the reasons I got involved in and in, in a struggle, if you like, in my own little way, was to hope that when the ANC did take over, the first thing they would do was ensure that Afrikaans, well, not Afrikaans, sorry, but uh, African language was compulsory, as was Afrikaans at the time. Uh, whether Afrikaans stayed or not, I really didn't care. I don't mind Afrikaans. I happen to enjoy speaking it, quite frankly. But I want to be able to speak an African language. It seems mm. to me an absolute insult that, Schools are being denied an opportunity to speak what should be a first language in our country. Mm. Yet it's not done. And I can't get an answer from anybody from the ANC or the EFF or, in fact, anybody. The, even Hanif, I asked him from the, uh, 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 Hendricks, and he couldn't answer the question either. What is it that we are not? Is it, is it some, I mean, I'm beginning to think this is some sort of political move that the ANC has got, is that they are petrified that people of, who are not black, will start to learn the language and then be able to, you know, to, to converse as, as we do with the DA candidate in Natal. Uh, you know, he's fluent in, in Isi Zulu, Isi Kosa. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Isi Zulu, what I'm saying. And, and, I mean, he's doing so well for that reason. Mm. And maybe the ANC figured that out early days and they haven't done it. But what's your view on that? Well, as, as a, um, an honours graduate in psychology, um, when I was busy with my studies, um, very clearly, uh, the, the research shows that children who do not engage in their first language or mother tongue at a primary school are at a distinct disadvantage. Uh, it slows their educational growth. Uh, it has the ability also to stunt uh, intellectual growth, and it puts those particular children on a, on a back foot where the level of instruction, particularly at, at primary, primary school level, if it's not in the, in the mother tongue. So the research is there. Um, why the ruling party would not want to introduce mother tongue instruction uh, throughout South Africa? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a second language. It doesn't have to be. So let's say you've got a school that's primarily English speaking or Afrikaans sure. speaking, but it must be a compulsory second language. Sure. But but what what is what is happening? I, I would, one of the reasons that I would I would put forward is is that um, it it favours the ruling party to have a nation uh, that is not well educated mm. um, because a nation that is not well educated is a nation that you can control. 
um, I, I said also as an educator, I spoke out even while I was in uh, within the system. Um, and, and at that time, I was not involved with, uh, with the ACDP. But I spoke out against uh, OBE, outcomes-based mm. education. I did my research and found that outcomes-based education failed in every country in which it was introduced. It failed in America. It failed in the UK. It failed in Australia. In the European countries where it was introduced, it failed. In America, they called it the dumbing down of the nation. Kids were leaving school. Uh, grade 12, not knowing how to read properly, spell. Sounds familiar? This is exactly where South Africa currently is. The Pearls study uh, about in 2023, I think it was, last year, uh, sh shows currently shows that our grade 4s, 81% of our grade 4s, after spending four years at school, are unable to read with meaning. Uh, so re literacy and numeracy in South Africa and in our schools is a problem. And it appears as if uh, it favors the ruling party if you have a nation uh, that is dependent on them, a nation that is dependent on handouts. We have uh, over 20 million South Africans now that are dependent on grants. And, and I like what you said in your, in your preamble, in your introduction. You know, it's jobs, 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 because it is jobs that actually gives our people the dignity uh, that they deserve. But if you are dependent on government, if you are unable to read with meaning, if you are unable to read particular documents, if you don't know what the Constitution actually says, if you don't know what government's policies are in terms of service delivery, if you don't know what the Municipal Finance Management Act and the other Finance Management Act and your supply chain manage, and you're unable to read in terms of how do we hold government to account. Uh, and so it appears as if, and this is, uh, one would say, a, a possible uh, communist socialist uh, yeah. Um, kind of uh, strategy. Yeah. So you you keep you keep the people uninformed. You keep yeah. them ignorant. You keep them dependent. We cannot yeah. allow for this to happen mm -hmm. in South Africa. So yes, I yeah. agree with you. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, that mother tongue introduction, uh, 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 teaching. I think that within our schools, Isi Zulu, uh, Kosa, uh, you know the the other eleven, uh, the the other um, indigenous languages need to be taught. In South Africa, I could could not agree with you more. It it not only is it it helps in terms of communication, um, but I think that those who are able to speak uh, two, three, or more languages are found to be also uh, intellectually stimulated, mm. um, and also mm. individuals who are able to mm. contribute more mm. to society. Mm. Um, mm. But it no, seems as if government certainly yeah. doesn't want uh, yeah. for that for yeah. that to I mean, happen. When, listen, we mustn't get sidetracked too much. But <laughs> what you raise, when you step back and you think about what you've just said, what you're actually saying is that we've got a massive amount of control that the, the government of the day, the ANC, literally sits down and says, how can we control our people? It's like a, it's like something out of a sci-fi movie. Yeah. We'll, we'll dumb down this, dumb down that. What? It, let's try this. Ob. It, it's failed everywhere else. So I'll tell you what. Let's try it. Yeah. That's just, that's just what we need. Something that won't work. So when the children come out of school, they can't read for meaning. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to understand balance sheets. And then we've got them in a sense under our control. Well, what do you what, think about well, it? Well, that's well, absolutely. We it's the scariest thing ever. But, but Mike, look, also look at what is happening with cadre deployment. You know, look at what is happening. Some municipal managers uh, haven't passed grade six. They don't know what a balance sheet actually is. You know, uh, they don't know their 10 times tables. And so these are some of the individuals mm. that are now mm. controlling yeah. uh, budgets with hundreds of millions, if not billions of rands. Um, and, and, and the ploy is, well, those are the people that you can control. There are a few, there are a handful um, of individuals who are the so-called elite uh, who now begin to push the buttons from behind uh, and control those individuals that they put into those particular places. Mm. Whereas if they were educated, mm. if they knew mm. uh, and they were worth the assault, mm. um, they would not be so easily manipulated by no. uh, by those in the background. But but so, so very clearly there is a, yeah. uh, a dedicated strategy to, with, to dumbing with, down and absolutely. keeping people uh, where they are. Yeah, without doubt. Um, I want to just, you mentioned cadres. Now, there's a lot of points in your manifesto that I really uh, approve of, but there's one overriding fact, or, and I want to just look at crime and justice. And the one overall, by the way, you, you'll be pleased to know, I scored you 41 out of 50. 
Okay, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so I'm like All a right. teacher now. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And I thought yeah, that's, that's a very 82%. good... That's re- <laughs> 82%. <laughs> exactly, so okay. well done. But uh, but I love your crime and justice. You've, you've covered it. It's, it's as I like it. It's what I expect to see. My problem with crime and justice is, though, uh, that I, that with the, with the ACDP in power, how are we going to deal, or how do you guys see you're going to deal what what essentially is not only is it kind of cadre deployment, but the fact that the people that are currently there now uh, in these positions are appointed by the ANC. Now you're going to come along. Um, and change that. And we have already the first mountain you have to climb is that the Hawks, SAPs, uh, uh, SIU, SIU yeah, NPA, uh, NPA uh-huh. all have one thing in common. They all report to the president of the country, the head of the ANC. And they, SIU guys and the Hawks can complain and moan as much as they like and claim they're, independent. they're not independent. They are definitely not independent. And sadly, by the way, the IEC is very much in the same boat, which worries me enormously, because Mr. Mamalolo, Mamalolo, who's the head of the IEC, was appointed by Zuma, and he makes no bones about the fact he's a Zuma man and a staunchly ANC. But I suppose that's a side issue at the moment. What are we going to do about that? Because we are never, ever going to get this country right until we can hold the president of the country to account and we have an independent and I like it I think you use the word scorpions in your manifesto because that's exactly what we need we have to have as you rightly put and I haven't got my glasses on but you want to bring back the disbanded scorpions (coughs) the hallelujah to that that surely is first prize well if you look at our uh, our manifesto one of the things that we say is that we need to have a crime fighting unit that is independent a crime fighting unit that is independent like your your chapter 9 institutions independent on government Great. independent of the president mm, yeah. um, and so that's one of the first things uh, much like how the scorpions were remember that when the scorpions were around the scorpions had a 90% conviction rate so those who were arrested by the scorpions 90% of those arrested were convicted and sent to jail uh, after Zuma came around, uh, the Scorpions were hollowed out, changed to the Hawks, placed under uh, SAPs, and SAPs, South African Police Service, has a 10%, 10% conviction rate. So of every 100 individuals that are arrested by SAPs, only 10% get convicted. That was then, and currently, Mike, currently it is still the same. Currently, in terms, particularly in terms of murder and rape, murder and rape, uh, we have only a 10% conviction rate. And it was the minister himself agreed that it is too low and they're wanting to beef up and so on, uh, Becky Gale. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's sad that this is what we are accepting uh, in, in South Africa. It's got to change. How is it possible that 90% of murderers get away in South yep. Africa? How is it possible that 90% of rapists get away in, in South Africa? It's one of the reasons why we're saying an independent crime-fighting unit uh, that needs to come into effect, similar to uh, how it was at the time of the Scorpions, where we can change that 10% conviction rate to a 90, if not 99 to 100% conviction rate. I think secondly, um, one of the things in terms of cadre deployment, we have to look at what I call the MPH uh, principle. MPH talks about meritocracy, uh, pragmatism, and honesty. And as well, coming into that, it is a, it is a professional civil service. There are those uh, cadres that have been placed there who are not fit for purpose. Mm. And if you are not fit fit for purpose, you've got to go. Um, we need to ensure that there's when when the ACDP comes into government, we do a skills audit. Uh, are you fit for purpose? Do you have the qualifications uh, for this particular managerial position, this particular director's or director general position? And if not, um, then uh, we, have to, we have to ensure uh, that we have people there that are competent, that are able, that are honest. So the MPH, uh, M is meritocracy, P is pragmatism. We've got to be pragmatic uh, and, and use what works. And the H is honesty. If you are dishonest, uh, we cannot have you. 
If you are somebody who connives, if you are somebody that lacks integrity, we cannot have you. Uh, we cannot have individuals serving the nation uh, who lack honesty, who lack integrity, and who, who are devoid of the fundamental ethical principles that our nation actually, actually needs. Then in addition to that, the ACDP is one of the few, if not the only, political party that has said, particularly for murder and, and for rape, uh, no bail. We've also said that, um, that those who are found guilty and are sentenced need to earn their keep in prison. Uh, we cannot have it that you mentioned that we have some 200 children that are dying of, of poverty, uh, starvation in South Africa every day. The other statistics indicates that there are some 25% of South Africans who go to bed hungry adults, mm. if not uh, children as well. It's seven Two, out of ten. So, seven out so, of ten, yeah. So we have, we have this huge uh, poverty uh, challenge in South Africa and crime statistic. The, the crime statistic is that more people die from murder in South Africa per annum then we have those who are actually killed in the Russian-Ukraine war. Well, if I can interrupt uh, you there, it's one every 20 minutes. Somebody is murdered <clears throat> in this country. <laughs> Wayne, so, I can't believe I just said that. But one every 20 minutes is murdered in this country. You are safer on the front line in the Ukraine yeah, than you absolutely. are in South Africa. And, and, and it's something that we, we must never... Uh, become accustomed to. Mm. We must, like we can never become accustomed to load shedding. Uh, like we must not become accustomed to now water shedding and the <sighs> corruption that we actually seen when? in South Africa. We've got to stand and yeah. fight it with everything that we've got. Now, I want to talk about the fight. You've, we, we've discussed the fact that we've got cardio deployment and I believe it's going to be very difficult to deal with it, but you are on the right track. What you have to, what you're talking about now and your manifesto says, we need to do those. We need to be an honest country, and we need to weed out. But to do that, we need to start growing the economy. Absolutely. Because quite frankly, unless we get this economy going, getting rid of, I think there's something like 96 police generals that are currently being investigated for corruption. I don't know how many policemen are serving, in, and they're all being investigated for corruption. Everything we do is just mired in corruption. And that is because we've got no money. So people are running around. The economy is not growing. People are looking for a way to make a buck. So they'll approach a police officer and they'll find a way to, to make a few rand illegally. So we need to get the economy going. And to do that, we need investment. Mm. Now, I want to ask uh, you as the ACDP, what are you going to do about that? Because unless we get foreign currency into this country and we can give a business this, the comfort that it, know, that it needs to know that it can trade here freely, I don't even want to touch on ESCOM. Let's assume we get ESCOM right. Mm -hmm. But even if we, a company is prepared to come here and muddle their way through, we cannot have a country, uh, we're not going to get a, a, a foreign investor into this country unless we get the basics right. We need to make them feel welcome. We can't be telling them whether they must have three Indians, four whites, six blacks, and heaven knows what else. We can't get involved in where they put their factory. We can't be allow, allow them to have unions telling them who they're going to employ. We've already had Volkswagen alluding to the fact that they might leave South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I noticed Ford also nodded their head gravely behind the scenes there. So we could be in a terrible, terrible mess very, very soon. We're trying to be keeping people here and bringing more people in, but we're not achieving that. And, and what is the ACDP going to do now to, to, to make this country more investable, that people want to come here, that we can compete more for business from the other side of the world? Well, uh, Mike, I think you've given a good background. So let's look at some of the, just some of the, the uh, statistics. We currently have a debt to GDP of, of around 73%. Um, we, we are sitting at a, at a situation where our GDP is around about 6 trillion, 6 trillion rand, but we've borrowed 5, over 5 trillion rand. Uh, hold All right, on a so. Six trillion rand. Six trillion rand is what is what the economy is worth. It's worth, right? and is, we've borrowed, and we've borrowed five. We've borrowed about five trillion. You mean we owe five trillion rand? <laughs> exactly. So what's happening right now is that our servicing of that debt is crowding out. Wow! It's, it's servicing of our debt is sitting around over three three hundred million, three hundred billion uh, per annum. All right. So so you you kind of coming close to one billion rand a day uh, in which we have to wow. spend. That, that's, wow. 
That's only paying the interest. It's only servicing the debt. It's not dealing with the debt itself. And the debt is expected. Tito Mboweni, when he was finance minister, said we could see the outer liers in the outer line years, our debt growing to as much as uh, going debt to GDP growing to about 80 percent and then even close to 90 percent. So this is where we are heading. We are heading towards the, fisc the fiscal cliff. So we've got this debt to GDP challenge. In addition to that, we have a, a dual deficit. We have a deficit on our current account. Uh, the current account essentially looks at your balance of payments, your imports versus your exports. We are actually now importing more than we are exporting. What does it mean? It means that we are creating jobs outside because we, what we could manufacture here in South Africa, we are now having to A wonderful import. point. We are now having to actually The beneficiation import. is taking place overseas with our raw materials. I, I'm coming to, I'm coming to <laughs> beneficiation. I sit on the trade and industry uh, <laughs> trade committee and I am the one who pushes beneficia beneficiation uh, like none other. I've asked for the Minister um, of Trade and Industry, Ibrahim Patel. I said, we need to have an index. An index because he says, yes, we are doing beneficiation. We've got this little thing going and we've got these batteries that are being manufactured here in South Africa. And we've got these catalytic converters. But in the, in the bigger scheme of things... Um, we are still exporting the large raw materials in South Africa. The bulk, South Africa is the largest exporter of raw materials on the continent. The largest exporter of raw materials. But where is the beneficiation? Yeah. How is it benefiting mm. our large unemployed mm. population? Mm. There, is, there is no effort, mm. concerted effort mm. by government mm. uh, to change things in order to uplift South Africans. So yes, there's the policy of beneficiation, but it's a policy that is not implemented. I was talking about balance of payments. We've got a deficit <laughs> on the balance of payments. We have our deficit on the on the national budget account. All right, That deficit is probably now sitting at about 5 to 6% also of GDP and growing. In other words, Treasury is not able to raise the revenue that is needed to fund the budget for the last few years. That means that every year they're having to borrow. In addition to the 500 billion that they had to seek uh, during the COVID era, era. By the way, that, that money also was, was not money that was given to South Africa. It was money that needed to be borrowed. Much of it also was stolen in terms of the PPE scandals uh, that we had in the country. But these are the challenges. That's kind of the background uh, that, we, that we currently have. Now, what is, what is the solution? What is it that the ACDP is saying? Well, one of the things that very clearly is that government needs to create an environment that is conducive for business to operate. How do you do that? You do that by ensuring that you have, firstly, political stability. So look at the ACDP. We have no scandals over the last 30 years. A party of integrity, a leader of integrity. Over the last 30 years, there's hardly a leader, political leader in the country uh, that has not had any scandal. Our leader, the Reverend Dr. Kenneth Meshwe, blameless record over the last 30 years. The ACDP, uh, impeccable record. So, number one, you need to have political stability. This is what the ACDP DP says we will be offering. Number two, you need to have policy certainty and policy stability. And I think you touched on that. We also, as the ACDP, uh, have said we cannot run the, 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 the business of the country, the economy, and grow the economy based on the current policies, racial policies that we have in South Africa, where you have broad-based black economic empowerment, which I said to the minister also, it's not broad. Uh, this is very narrow. There's a few individuals that you and I are able to point to who have been given shares in particular companies uh, and who have been able to become billionaires overnight uh, just because of their political affiliation. Mm. Uh, so this B, uh, triple B, E, 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 it's not broad, it's very narrow, and it is not helping South Africans. Affirmative action. I challenged them also on affirmative action. I said I have a background also in psychology. One of the studies also in psychology says affirmative action does not psychologically help the individual because the individual who is placed in a particular position of affirmative action believes that they are there not on merit. Correct. They are there because Correct. of the color of their skin. They are there because they, uh, they've been pushed, pushed ahead. And so they, they struggle with this, 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 the cycle, the, almost mm. like a cognitive mm. dissonance and they kind of disconnect well, you know, I'm just going to kind of do my best. And so you, you are placed in a position, not necessarily because you are competent and fit for the position, but be, because of the color of your skin. Mm. It cannot be. Mm. Now, mm. having said that, I've said to the minister as well, I said that black people 
are competent. Black people are intelligent. Black people are wise. What is needed is the opportunity. How do we give them that opportunity? It's got to come through education. And what we're having is a disjunct between the skills that are needed by the business sector and what our universities mm. and our schools are actually mm. offering. So what mm. the ACDP is saying is a part of our economic policy. There's got to be this fit for purpose. What, what is it that the schools and your your higher institutions are actually pushing out in terms of what it is that your your business sector are actually need. What are the skills that your business sector is meeting? We were the, as the AC needing. We we as the ACDP were one of the first, if not the first, political party that said our children ought to be learning coding at primary school level. Well, yeah. a few years later, yeah. Ramaphosa says we're yeah. going to be introducing coding yeah. at a primary school level, and, right? did so, anyway. and, and nothing and nothing was Typical, done. But but yeah. but but this is the thing: I grew up under apartheid as mm. a so-called black individual. Mm. Right? I hold my own. Mm. I hold my own mm. intellectually. I hold mm. my own economically. Mm. Um, and I worked, and there mm. are many of us mm. in the mm. ACDP mm. who are black, considered mm. black South Africans, mm. who worked hard mm. during apartheid, mm. and who are academically and mm. otherwise mm. equipped and skilled mm. uh, to serve South Africa. Now, this is what needs to happen across the board. You spoke about, you know, uh, the second language in terms of some of the indigenous indigenous na- languages that need to come through. But I think that, uh, that over and above that as well, we've got to look at skills. Skills, skills development, uh, skills that are needed. Your your IT, uh, the, the IT sector. Um, we, we've got to look at also the competitive and the comparative advantages that South Africa offers. Um, you know, we have eighty to ninety percent of the world's platinum reserves in South Africa. South Africa holds eighty. To, now, Saudi Arabia, if they are holding eighty percent of the world's oil reserves. Look at how Saudi Arabia uses that to the benefit of their people. Exactly. Why is it and that they in don't South even Africa, get it out the ground themselves? They hire everybody else. The whole world is there. Saudi Arabia has got the good sense to let experts do the job. Well, absolutely. You know, we we did a we did a a, a tour to uh, a visit to South South Korea. Mm. South Korea has got yeah. nowhere near the resources, the mineral mm. resources. They import mm. all of the re, mm. uh, re, uh, resource min, uh, raw materials that mm. they need, uh, but they have one of the biggest shipbuilding mm. now. Uh, the country is uh, one of the countries that has the biggest shipbuilding mm. industry mm. in the world, mm. competing with Germany, competing mm. with the United States mm. in terms of the shipbuilding industry, in terms of logistics, DHL, uh, one of the biggest uh, logistics companies in, uh, in, in South Korea. But it is because also of their focus on what were the skills that South Korea needed uh, from, a, from a total agrarian nation, a nation that was exporting squid and fish uh, and so on, to a nation now that is exporting, uh, manufacturing and exporting vehicles and electrical Correct. goods and so on. Yeah. Now, it was almost at the same time um, in the 1960s, uh, coming up to the 1980s, um, and if one, it, it took them about 30 years, 30 to 40 years, to turn South Korea from an agrarian nation to a highly industrialized nation mm. where unemployment mm. is hardly heard of. Mm. Um, so what, we have, why, why what we have, what we have, what we have in South Africa is a, a government mm. that is incapable of implementing its own policies. A government that has been caught with his hands in the cookie jar. Uh, in terms of the Auditor General himself, we have local government that is failing, and Mike, that is one of the one of the big concerns mm. is the failure at local government mm. where service delivery ought to take place. Our our slogan uh, from our manifesto is SOS. Mm. It's service, it's order, and it's security. Mm. We are, as the ACDP, we are hearing the cry of the millions of South Africans. Help us. There is no service coming to us. We are unable to get uh, uh, electricity. <laughs> I come from, I just come from home, Durban. We've had no electricity for the last two days. Um, prior to that, electricity was off uh, for for three about three days. There are areas no, in there are areas, How do they, there are areas in Itikwini that haven't had water from 2021. Mm. 
Um, and, and so, and, and it's the, the, the challenges are growing because of a failure also from government to invest in infrastructure development. If we want to turn the economy around, one of the key things also has to be infrastructure mm. development. Your economy <clears throat> is only be, is going yeah. to be as you, good as your infrastructure I, is. What you're saying, Wayne, I, I heartily agree with, and I don't think any sane person can disagree. I mean, it makes absolute sense. But, you know, in the back of my head, what worries me so much with our current government is the fact that when both presidents talk about the fact that the ANC comes first and the country comes second, I can't help sometimes feeling we're just talking in a vacuum here. Because we have the ANC government, which until the people of this country wake up to the fact that they are not uh, first prize as far as the ANC is concerned, what the ANC wants to do is look after its own. And it is, in fact, not a political party. As I've said before on this show, it's a criminal syndicate. Uh, it was a political party when I was involved, yeah, very much so. Yeah. But it has morphed into a criminal syndicate. Mm. And our problem we have is that we people haven't quite woken up to that fact. And looking at the... And you talk about Durban, it was on TV last night, and I was shocked to see these poor guys uh, living in absolute squalor. When asked who they were going to vote for, they said, well, we don't really know. You know, we, we, know, we know the DA, we know the, the... I think it was the IFP, and we know the ANC. So yeah. we're going to vote ANC. Mm. And, and I said, oh, what are we going to do? But as the commentator on that show made the point, nobody is there. The DA yeah. is not there. Yeah. The ANC is not there. Mm. ADCDP probably isn't there. Mm. But I know there's a limited resources of where you can be. So it's sure. easy to make that criticism. But sure. it, I do wonder if maybe that's where we, we're slipping down. Are we not? Well, I, I think so. I, I think, look, Mike, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, the, the, the scale of the problem uh, is now be, has it's become just so yeah, so it immense yeah. um, that it it seems like there are so many that are kind of giving up and giving up even on the hope uh, that politically the problems that South Africa faces can be changed. I want to just encourage South Africans: there is an opportunity. Twenty um, ninth of May, twenty twenty four, is a window of opportunity for South Africans to go out and make that change, uh, the change that we all long for. We we have a government, and you mentioned the fact that uh, you know we we have individuals that are basically corrupt, and we have a mafia, uh, in a sense, a mm. mafia state mm. Uh, mm. that is that is developing. You know, we, we see this happening all over. Uh, we have the construction mafia, yes, where where business up. business Indeed. is losing billions Indeed. of rands Indeed. because of individuals who come and say yeah. we we demand our thirty yeah. percent. As the ACDP, we raised it, and we were told, "Don't call it mm. a mafia. It's not a mafia. You need to understand that these are people struggling. Nonsense. They are criminals, Correct. and they need to be prosecuted." And the ACDP has raised that in Parliament. You know, we have the cons now we have the transport mafia. Look at what is happening in Riches Bay at the at the Riches Bay terminal, mm. where uh, the rail, our railway infrastructure is being deliberately sabotaged Correct. so that we, they could, this yeah. transport mafia can get more trucks, trucks on, on the, the road. road. Now, we need a government yeah. that is able to take on the unions, yeah. that is able to take on these mafias without fear, well, without favor, without well, prejudice and say, we are going yeah. to deal with we you, need, not we, in our you know, watch. Yeah, exactly. Whether we're going to get the message out there this election, I don't know, but I'm feeling quite positive all the time, especially when I listen to people like yourself and look at the work that you've done as a party. So I do have encouragement. I'm not, uh, but I am, I am extremely concerned. One thing I want to touch on as well. Oh, well, look, we have a message here. Why do we have people continue talking about five billion when it was a trillion rand? Is that, a, is that a message that we've just received? I'm assuming. We got it wrong. It's a well, trillion rand. Well, I, I think the trillion rand was with regards to the Zuma era of ah, what what, okay. what Ramaphosa called himself called the wasted nine years, years, nine, wasted, nine years. wasted years. So, so if we look at those nine wasted years, the ch the, the the cost to the economy um, was was some yeah. one trillion rand at the time. It was some twenty five percent of our GDP. The the GDP was at about uh, five five trillion at the time. Um, it is, uh, and, and the cost of those nine wasted years was some one trillion rand. And <laughs> the Zondo Commission unpacked that. And who has been held to account? No one. Because very clearly, uh, like you also said, Mike, uh, that the both Ramaphosa and uh, Zuma 
uh, would rather protect the ANC mm. than put South Africans yeah, first. Yeah. You know, they, they do not yeah. understand the principle of servant leadership as I the always, ACDP does. Always try and visualize this. If you take a football field or a soccer field and you take a billion rand, if I'm not mistaken, I think you'd have a, a, thousand, a, hundred, a, a thousand piles of a thousand rand. No, 10,000 piles of a thousand, of a thousand rand On, consisting of 200 rand notes all burning. Wow. All at once, okay. poof, and that's what we do on a daily basis. Yeah. We just burn it; it's gone. I mean, you know, because this this billion trillion just slips off the tongue so easily. I want to quickly touch on on NHI because we are rapidly running out of time, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Just touching on NHI, um, I want to just make a quick comment. I don't understand what's going on again. It's an ANC ideology. My view is. If I want to live, uh, drive, or catch a bus every day and save all my money and spend it on having a private health care, that's my choice. Absolutely. I've paid my tax on my money. If I want to use the government health care, that's also my choice. Mm -hmm. But I, it's, it's my choice as to where I take my money. Um, the private health care do not steal anybody's money. Mm -hmm. they, they operate entirely independent of the taxpayer, the poor, the everybody. And I have medical aid, and I'm happy to pay for it. It's expensive, I agree. But I don't want to die in a government hospital. Mm -hmm. Certainly not in any other province. The Western mm -hmm. Cape's not that bad. But what's your take on that? Are we in agreement on that? Or does do you see this merging of the two, uh, the, the private and government, because uh, as, as something that will work in the long term? Or where are we no, with the, no, the ACDP, right, right from the outset, when NHI was, was first uh, introduced or mooted, mentioned by uh, by government that this is what they're looking at doing. The ACDP took a policy decision uh, that we cannot support NHI. What government ought to be doing is investing in our public hospitals, um, turning those hospitals uh, to the state of where our private hospitals actually are. That's the intention. That's what government should be doing. Mm. Our hospitals mm. shouldn't be places that are uh, themselves have become health hazards where we have rats uh, that are running around in some hospitals yes, and indeed. sewer spilling out into the streets and water coming through the roofs and into, um, into wards. Um, so very clearly, the ACDP's position is that government ought to take uh, taxpayers' money and invest in the, the, the public health care system and ensure uh, that we have the necessary qualified doctors uh, that are able to, to perform uh, their duties um, uh, efficiently and, and in conducive environments where the electricity works, where the water, where the water runs and the theatres are, 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 are properly resourced. Uh, that our nurses also are, are properly trained and skilled, uh, and, and, and they are some of the best in the world, and that's why many other countries uh, you know, seek South African, uh, South African nurses because they are well-skilled uh, and hard-working. And, and we need to ensure that the hospitals also are properly capacitated. Um, what is sad, Mike, is that some 80% of our hospitals do not meet governments, the standards that government has set. Mm. They do not meet not the health, their own standards. Their own standards. Mm. They, do not, they do not meet some 80% of our, if not more. Uh, I think it was, uh, let me not get the statistics messed up, but it it's may even be more than 80% of our public hospitals that do not meet the standards in terms of health, that do not meet the standards in terms of uh, vacancies that need to be filled, that do not meet the standards in terms of administration, that do not meet the standards in terms of the necessary medication that ought to be in the hospitals to service the patients. Uh, over 80% of our public, we are saying public hospitals don't yeah. meet those standards. We are saying as the ACDP, Government set your house in order mm. uh, before you would seek to mm. introduce mm. a national health uh, insurance. Look, by the way, um, I, I think a, a universal um, health system is what we all desire, where everybody has access uh, to, to, to adequate health care. And that is possible if we have a public health system that is efficient, a public health system that works, a public health system where you don't have 80-year-olds having to queue up at, at 8 o'clock, uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, like some of the ladies from my church have to do. And I know because they complain. Um, you know, they have to take chairs and umbrellas out in the rain and the elements uh, just to get their, their, their monthly medication or for their, for their monthly visit. And, and so we've got to be able to ensure that our hospitals are streamlined, that they work efficiently, that they are properly resourced. Uh, NHI, 
um, will will see our health system collapse. Mm. Um, mm. There are uh, many doctors who have already indicated that that this will be the last straw for them. And I, I chatted to a uh, a specialist, a surgeon um, that we, we I cycle with uh, down in Durban, and he indicated. He says many of his family have left. He's decided to stay in South Africa to work and to to make things work to help to contribute uh, to the success of the of, of South Africans. He says, but if NHI comes, he's going to be forced to do what his siblings have done and to leave South mm. Africa. And there are hundreds of thousands mm. of mm. medical practitioners mm. who will do the same mm. thing. It will be the it will be the death of our health system in South Africa. But but also, um, you know, if if NHI is introduced, um, in terms of how the bill is is uh, is defined, uh, your public your private hospitals will not be able to offer what government offers, and so essentially there's going to be more job losses. So you're going to have your you know those who are working for medical aids and those who are working within the private healthcare. Mm. Your private healthcare sectors are going to have to cut down because government is now offering <laughs> all of these so-called services, yeah. and so certainly it it would you'll find job loss as well. And then the big question is, where is the money going to come from? Well, indeed. Uh, and I mean, so, here we have so a bill. There's no clarity it, it, in it, terms it, of how this is going to be funded. Indeed. You know, Wayne, I go back to what I said at the beginning of the show about Parliament, and it's, it's really relevant anymore. What on earth, or who on earth, or which government on earth passes a bill through Parliament without a budget? I, I mean, they've just passed this bill. We don't know if it's going to cost twenty billion, ten trillion, squillion, million. We just yeah. don't know. Yeah. Well. And the bull is sitting on the president's desk. What madness is this? This is this. Honestly, I think, I think they um, are smoking the same stuff as, as our other friend. You know, it's just, <laughs> well, it's it, just it's can't a, get over it. It's another SOS that has gone out, yeah. uh, Mike. It's another you know service order safety yeah. uh, for, that the ACDP is hearing, and very clearly. Uh, the ACDP has been one of those political yeah. parties that says NHI is not going to work in South Africa. Yeah. Look, by the way, look at what is happening in the UK and government. I believe they, so. they they kind of you know say look at look at NHI, but you cannot also compare the United Kingdom firstly to South Africa, right? You're talking about you're talking about apples and uh, no, it's a, it's a <laughs> apples and bananas. Yeah. But the fact of the matter, even in even the there, country as they are having challenges. Absolutely, they are, are having they're having challenges. challenges. Yeah. And they, so we they need are, to learn from. Yeah, we what do. Is and, and I mean, jeepers, we're not even close to them. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. I want to ask you, Nando. Oh, another question. Oh, you replied. No, my understanding of that loan oh. was 500 billion was given, and then later another 500 billion was given in terms of what was needed in the COVID time. Just go back and follow it up. Okay. Well, this is the challenge. Um, there's been so There's been so many... Uh, in terms of government borrowing, there has been so many uh, interventions from government uh, during the COVID period uh, to try to cover what was one of the harshest lockdowns in the world. Um, as a result of that COVID period, we lost some two to three million jobs during the during the lockdown. So some two to and government was at sixes and sevens and had to be borrowing uh, borrowing money. Uh, and all of that is now reflecting in our in our debt to GDP. And very clearly, we go cap in hand, uh, easy money for, for government, easy money for them to again get their hands on, uh, easy money for them to pull, pull for, easy for them to loot. Uh, we have an, another scandal where the former Minister of Health is now uh, being questioned in terms of his involvement in the PPE scandals. Uh, there are so many others. Uh, that have been involved in money that was supposed to be there to assist the poor, to assist those. It was, it is absolutely ridiculous, um, and and saddens me where members of my family that have uh, re related that have passed on mm. uh, because during the COVID period there was no oxygen in the hospitals. Yeah, I was I was desperately making phone calls yeah. to friends. Mm. Um, do you have access to an oxyg uh, uh, oxygen tank? Mm. There is a, f a relative of mine that needs oxygen. And, and these were the kinds of things that ordinary members and ordinary people in South Africa had to put up with. While those billions of rands were, were being 
borrowed by South Africa, supposedly uh, to assist uh, the, the poor and the indigent and, and those desperately in need amongst us, uh, but rather you went into the pockets uh, of the greedy in the ruling party. Yep. And they Lant, must be held to account. Lant are suspended prime, um, so so come the 29th yeah. of May 2024, there has to be a change of government at the ballot boxes. It, it would be too ghastly to contemplate another five years uh, under the ruling party. South Africa cannot afford another five years. We want to say to every South African out there who has registered to vote, please use your right, your constitutional right to, to, to vote and to use that right properly and to make sure that South Africa is placed on the correct trajectory mm. Mm. and the party mm. uh, that has no mm. scandals, mm. no uh, no mm. history mm. of pilfering is the African Christian Democratic Indeed. Party. And yep. we are saying to you, vote for the ACDP. Yep. We've heard your cry. We've heard the groaning. There's a scripture that says, when the righteous are in authority, it's it's from, from the, the wisdom books, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the ungodly and the unrighteous are in authority, the people mourn. And South Africans have been mourning for the last few decades. We cannot allow for this to continue ad infinitum. We've got to put a stop to it. And we can at the ballot box on the 29th of May. Well, I really do hope that the government does say au revoir and disappear, as you suggest. And I really do hope the people are listening to you. We, as you rightly say, Wayne, we just simply can't go on. There were some pundits who were saying, well, maybe another five years and we'll take care of the ANC. We're too far down the line. If we don't take care of the ANC and move them out of government this year, we're in, it's too late. Yeah. I mean, I think it is just it, it too may, late. It may be. It may just be too late. That's right. I want to just wrap up. I think I want to just ask, how am I doing for time, man? Antle, I've lost the clock. Uh, with the, one hour and 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So we are well over time. So I want to apologize for that. I want to just pick up on one thing. Mm. Uh, um, on, 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 on your manifesto, you, you mentioned Israel. Now, yes. your, your uh, position in Israel is clear. Mm. Uh, I mean, I'm not even going to repeat it. You're on with Israel. You support Israel's right to defend itself. Yes. But I was curious as to why you put it in. Because my view is, you know, it's not, if there's wars all over the world. Sure. We've got, Haiti is in an absolute mess. Mm. Sudan. Mm. I, I don't know how many thousands mm. of Muslims have been killed there. I'm not going to, I think it's just, but it's been a bloodbath there. Sure. And it's still continuing. Sure. Nigeria, another 300 girls kidnapped. Mm. Um, obviously, we've got the Palestinian, uh, or the Hamas war in sure. Palestine and, and Gaza. Sure. Uh, we've got Yemen, mm. another with gas, uh, ga children, people have been gassed. <sighs> I'm not sure that, you know, Israel is fighting a war mm. and, and, and they have the right, in my opinion, as well to defend themselves. I'm completely sure. support that 100%. Sure. But, you know, should you not really then have put all these other countries in? Because there is so much going on in this country. I, I question why we single out Israel. Israel's been attacked and mm. is defending itself. Right. And is defending its position. A country smaller than the Kruger National Park mm. <laughs> is being attacked by literally the whole entire world, as far as I can make out, and anti-Semitism <clears throat> is on the rise to a frightening level. Frightening level. Yeah. You, but you put in Israel, I guess, because, I mean, it's, it's sure. a bit of a rhetoric question, I think. But I, I'm asking whether you should have put it in there. Do you think it was necessary then, or should you not have put all these other countries in that <clears throat> you have a view on? Well, we put, we put Israel in precisely because, look, firstly, um, every political party is guided by a particular worldview. The worldview, you know, your, your ANC is socialist, communist. You've got the Communist Party. That's their worldview. You have the DA that is kind of a liberal, secular, um, you know, humanistic perhaps uh, worldview. Um, so every political party has a particular worldview and is guided by their worldview. The ACDP holds for us to a biblical worldview. And our biblical worldview calls for us uh, to continue to pray, 
uh, for the peace of Jerusalem and to pray for Israel, that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be, will be cursed. And so that's the position that we, that we take. We will not uh, offer any apologies for our worldview. We do not ask you to apologize, other political parties, to apologize for your worldview. Don't ask the ACDP to apologize for the worldview that we espouse and we hold dear to. We will not. So, but the second, the second thing is, is that very clearly it distinguishes the ACDP from other political parties as well. One of the reasons why we actually put that there. Um, the ACDP has been one of the few political parties, if not the only political party, that has stood up in defense of Israel and in, in parliament and, and have indicated that Israel has a right to defend itself. And for Mike, the, ve- the mere fact that you've got almost, uh, you know, 80% of, uh, of the world media turning against Israel and countries, other countries turning against Israel and saying to Israel, you do not have a right to defend yourself against a terrorist organization. The problem is not the mm. Palestinians. No, it's not. And the, and the ACDP agree. has said that very, very clearly. Mm. You know, we want to see an end to this war. Mm. We want to see that the Palestinians and the Israelis are able to live next to each other because essentially they are brothers and sisters uh, if one looks at their, their heritage uh, and their lineage. So these are brothers and sisters, and we want to see them live together in peace and in harmony. But how do you live in peace and in harmony with a group, the terrorist group, which is Hamas, that threatens your annihilation, that says that we will look at their charter. Their charter calls for the genocide. If ever there is a group that has called for genocide, it's Hamas. They've, and they've, uh, they haven't just said it verbally, they've put it in writing. It's, it's, it's within <coughs> their charters and the articles well, that they, they actually have. Well, it goes further than that, so, what um, I find scary is it's not just Jews in, in Israel, it's Jews throughout the world. Exactly. I, I mean, what, how can the world possibly even think of supporting an organization? And, and that so makes the sense? reason, it's just, well, and that's exactly, Mike, speeches. why we, why we've put that because we we believe that we need to also alert Christians, particularly Christians who are being caught up, but not just Christians, but mm. I think I think all those who are looking at uh, at this from from just one side, a one sided mm. angle, mm. and and we need so, to so, so, alert them. So mm. I just interject. Mm. I just want to ask this question: um, How do you how do you reconcile being a Christian and and seeing what Israel is doing to innocent kids and and females, how they bomb them, and 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 and, and sorry, my mic isn't working. But um, and how they, how they, um, they they tell people that they tell the majority of the people to go to the to the one side of of, of, mm. of, of Palestine mm. or of, of Gaza, mm. and then they bomb them along the way. So how do you how do you reconcile that that behavior mm. as a Christian mm. and still still say that you 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 support Israel? I think that in every war, there are, there are casualties. <clears throat> but there is not an army that I know of in the world that sends a message to individuals mm. to say, we are going to be attacking, mm. and we are coming after Hamas, and our, our intelligence informs us that they are hiding under this particular hospital, or they are hiding under this particular nursery school, um, and they are attacking and firing rockets from a, either a hospital or a United Nations building, because that's what has been happening. Um, so there's not an army in the world that I know that sends messages to indicate that they're going to attack to avoid civilian uh, casualties. Now, the, the, uh, the firing or the, the killing of people along, along the route where they've been asking people to, indiv- to move, our, our information has been that some of that has actually been perpetrated by Hamas itself. Because Hamas does not want people to leave the buildings where Israel has informed them that there's going to be an attack. Hamas wants those, those casualties. And it has been shown also that some of the rockets that have been fired from Gaza have actually fallen on, uh, in Gaza and on resulted in, in human casualties yeah. in Gaza. Yeah. There may have been instances where uh, where there has been and instances that we may not know of, but where there are instances where human life and your women and children have been, innocent women and children have been killed, the ACDP cannot and will not and will never condone that. We will call Israel out. 
uh, where we have the information and the proof. We will call Israel out. But we will also uh, de defend the right of Israel um, to defend itself hmm. from a terrorist organization. But, I think, but, what, sorry, but what do you say to South Africa has made a, has made a brilliant case at the I, 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 ICJ and to, 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 to say how, how the genocide has happened. They have proven that the genocide is happening. But how can you still, as a Christian, still say that you support Israel? Well, I think I want to differ. I can understand yeah. from a politician you can sure. say that. But from a Christian, how can you still say that? Uh, I, let, me, let me differ. I want, to, I want to differ with you also on the outcome of the ICG, uh, ICJ case. The ICJ case didn't prove that there was genocide. They actually said that there's, there's the possibility, and the case now needs to be further investigated. All right, Where they found that there was genocide, and the ICG was uh, Russia-Ukraine. They said to Russia, this is genocide. And Russia needs to desist. So there you have a proven case. In the ICG, uh, ICJ case, it was not, Israel was not told that you are, this is now definite that you are actually committing genocide. There is an investigation that the ICJ said that needs to, there's a possibility, a probability that yes, genocide may, may be taking case. So the ICJ, uh, ICJ did not definitively indicate that there was genocide. How do we defend this as, as, as Christians? Well, again, I, I said it is, it is from a, um, our, our biblical worldview and our worldview to, and, and, and where there is the, the killing of the innocents, we will, we will roundly condemn that. And like I said, we will call Israel out um, because there can be no excuse uh, for any innocence, uh, innocent women mm. and children to, mm. be, to be taken out. Mm. So, so, the AC, so the ACDP is on yeah. record for yeah. indicating that that is mm. what, that is what we will do. Sorry, sorry, sorry Natal. Is it, not, is it not a case, though? Why does, because uh, now we really are running against the clock here, but, uh, and I do need to wrap up because I have to go, but why is it that, uh, Israel at all, and Hamas, why does Hamas just not release the hostages and stop the bombing? That Israel would have to stop the war. You know what I mean there? Sure. Uh, I mean, why don't they embarrass Israel into this to say, you know what, here are the hostages back, including unbelievably two little children, I think, still there. Here are the hostages back, and they stop firing rockets at Israel. Now you've got this, now Israel certainly will have to withdraw. They have to. They can't just stay there. They'll have no moral ground in which they why why does Hamas not do that? Well, I, I wish I wish I was able to answer for Hamas. Yeah, sure. But no, I, think, okay question, I think I think I think that I mean look, to my mind one it's of, so simple. Well one of one of the reasons, the possible reasons, is that Hamas um, look very clearly they they are using individuals and the Palestinians as human shields. Yeah. Um, Hamas is um, is a a, a terrorist organization which I believe does not have the interests of the Palestinians at heart. Because if they had the interests of the Palestinians at heart, we've seen also food aid going into to Gaza and people, you know, running to those trucks and then being shot at and kicked off the trucks by Hamas mm. soldiers. Um, so Hamas yeah. really clearly doesn't have the Palestinians, if yeah. they had the Palestinians at heart. Look, taking hostages, taking civilians, it's, it's an international violation in terms of war. You do not take civilians as captives. You take soldiers as captives. But what Hamas has done is they've broken international law. And I'm not hearing anybody who's saying, but what Hamas is doing violates international law. The women that they've actually taken have been raped. Very many of them have been killed, um, and sadistically so. Uh, and there's, there's, no, there, there's no talk mm. about what Hamas mm. is doing. Mm. Um, but sadly... Uh, also, within a war situation, there are going to be casualties. The ACDP is saddened at the loss of life well, I think uh, that, we, I mean, that we cut. But let me also yes. indicate that it's not only Israel that we've spoken about as the ACDP. The ACDP has also spoken about what is happening in Mozambique, where churches have been burnt down by uh, groups of, um, you know, your, the, the jihadists uh, that have now come down right to the northern parts of Mozambique. The ACDP has also spoken out against what has taken place in Nigeria, and you made reference to that, where, you know, you, you've got churches that are being burnt down in Nigeria, those, those girls that are being abducted, and the world seems to be silent. Uh, we, the ACDP has also spoken, about, uh, spoken out against churches uh, that have been burnt and, and killed in India uh, by, uh, by the, uh, 
the the the, the uh, uh, fundamentalist groups uh, in in India, and these these are not Muslims. These are I think some of the Hindu groups. The ACDP has spoken out against that. The ACDP has also spoken about an in, uh, spoken out about what is happening in Northern Africa, where you have a slave trade that is taking place. Christians that are being taken, Muslims that are being taken as slaves and sold as slaves in Northern Africa. It is unacceptable. So the ACDP, wherever there is an injustice, we will speak out against it. When I want to thank you very, very much. Um, I uh, we really are way over time. <laughs> uh, maybe we should have started that conversation at the beginning of the show, sure. but I know we would have been digressed. But I want to just uh, say to the viewers, thank you very much for watching. I do hope that you have found the show uh, something by way of educational, topical, and I hope also somewhat entertaining. I hope we now find out a little bit more about the uh, manifesto of the ACDP, and it is available on their website. And it's a very good website, by the way. I'm actually becoming a bit of an expert on websites as well, Wayne. <laughs> and it is a pleasure to use your website. It's, it's easy. The manifesto is right there. It downloads nice and quickly. You can print it off very easily. It's not a long manifesto. So if you really want to know more about the ACDP, do take a look at their website. I want to just uh, leave you with uh, a thought. Malcolm X, he said, you can't separate peace and freedom because no one can be at peace unless he has his freedom. I think that's very relevant to where we are today. And then I always like to give a shout out to my most favorite podcaster, Katla Hongwahi. <laughs> she has a show called The Citizen Concerned. If you haven't watched it, do watch it. Um, and uh, she always makes the statement at the end of the show, which I do and always enjoy. Beware of the comrades. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very one much, Wayne. Oh, yes. Just to acknowledge our viewers, just let us know. Yeah, just to Uh, okay. Uh, do you want us to comment on it? Yeah, no, no, you don't have to. Uh, uh, as I like can't. Let, let the viewers also. You're right, sorry. Can we leave it up now? Yes, sorry. So, yeah. uh, can you. I think they're basically saying that both countries are at fault uh, in the. Hamas, um, well, Gaza, Palestinian, uh, the yes. Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, so two wrongs don't make a right. I can't support any as one death over a thousand deaths is no different. Uh, wrong stays wrong. So my opinion is both these countries are at fault. Ten kids killed over a thousand. What are we saying about uh, the ten? Their lives don't matter. We need to be objective. Mm. Um, right. Well, it's, I think it's a fair statement. Yeah, I yeah, know, fair really? enough. But the fact of the matter is that Israel was attacked and they are defending themselves. Sure. So, you know, I think it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, what's that, there's a word for it, but it will go around in a big circle, I think, at the end of the day. <laughs> Everybody has a view. I must say, it is the most emotional topic that I've sure. ever been involved in. I, I mean, I, even in apartheid days, I used to get into terrible fights with my um you know, friends about apartheid were those that supported and those didn't. Yeah. And it was emotional, but nothing like this. Yeah. But nevertheless, um, uh, thanks again. And uh, Nantel, thank you very much. And uh, I want to say good luck with the, uh, your um, campaign going forward. And maybe see you again after the 29th of June. Uh, and uh, sorry, May, May, May 29th yes. of May, of course. Uh, 29th of May, we'll see you there. And maybe we can get together and. Do looking a forward, debrief. Looking forward to it. And looking see where we all are as a country and what we're going to do next. Looking so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Me. Thank you.